Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is an appointed and divine appointment. You are not here. I am not here together by any happenstance or coincidence or accident. This is an appointed time for His Word to go forth through this time into your life and into mine. You know, that I think that's what I love about God, just about one of the things I love most about Him, is that He is sovereign and in control. He is seated on His throne, and He controls it all. And I that's how I know that this is not just a, a chance meeting between you and and me and the Lord. This was appointed before the foundations of the world. You know, he declares in his word that he has prepared beforehand good works for us to to um, do in this world, to complete for him. And this is a good work for me. Uh, not that the I do a good work, but it's a good work that he's prepared for me to do. It's his work. It's his goodness. And I'm just walking out the destiny that he has prepared for me with his work. And that's how I feel about you, that God has prepared you for this good work, his good work through this word. So I'm coming to you today with a message called tongue lashing. You know, we can get very hurt by words. Uh, we can hurt with words. And we know a lot of the scriptures we've been preached to before. We've been taught about the power of our words. And I'm going to start there in Ephesians chapter 4, but I'm going to end in a different place. So if you just hang in with this word, God wants to show us something brand new, I think, uh, at the end of this, this study for us to operate in and to walk in and to um, richly uh, improve our lives. So I think that if you just tune in your heart to his word, God's going to speak to us today because he spoke to me as I was going through this little message. 99% of the time when I come to you with a word, it's because God has either dealt with me about it, or I've had to walk through something with God, or something has happened in my life or in the lives of those close to me and around me, that God gives me a word. And this one is no different. I was hurt recently in the last few days by someone close in my family. And God was trying to speak this word to me as I was going through what I went through. And so I'm coming to you out of a little bit of a brokenness that God has um, restored in my soul. You remember David prayed, God, restore my soul? And that's what I pray, God, restore my soul. And I had a friend pray with me today and prayed that very thing. She didn't even know that she was um, confirming what I had prayed and that she had, uh, had prayed for what she called the restoration of my soul. That is agreement. And so can I just share this with you out of my tender, fragile, kind of put back together heart, this word called tongue lashing. Now, the word, I'm going to use the word edification or building up. And the word edification comes from an architectural word that means an edifice or a building. Simply stated, building up has to do with building in an architectural way from the foundation on up. We, the church, are that building, or the church is the building. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a body, into a temple, a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. And then 1 Peter 2.5 says, You are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, we are the spiritual house. We are the building 
the edifice. We are the thing that God is building up through us. And it says that he might find a dwelling place for himself. That's us. We are the dwelling place of God. We are the building, the dwelling, the edifice, jointly fitted together. This is us. We are responsible for the shape of our rock. Amen? We are responsible for how our rock or our stone fits in with all the other rocks and stones. But here's what I want to share with you. We're also sort of jointly responsible for the other rocks around us and how we fit into them and how they fit into us. Sometimes I might have a jagged edge that someone else's rock has to sort of beat down a little bit and round it off so I fit in. Someone else might have a protruding edge that won't fit quite right. And I have to, in my rock, round off that other person's rock to let them jointly fit with all the other rocks. So if we look at the fact that we are building blocks together and how my rock fits and your rock fits and other rocks fit are, is of the utmost importance in this building. The focus of edification or building up, because when we edify someone, we build them up. The focus of edification is always the end project or the end, um, um, the, the end result of what we're doing. In other words, it's okay to think about each and every rock, but each and every rock only serves to complete the whole dwelling or the whole building. And the goal is always the end result. What's the building going to look like in its entirety, not just one rock? I mean, when have you gone to a house, to look at a new house and go, oh, look at that brick, that one brick right in there. That is a great brick. <laughs> we never say that. We go, wow, look at how that house looks. It's beautiful. All the bricks fit together, all the rock or the stone. We never pick out one rock or one brick or one stone. Can you imagine going into someone's house and looking at a fireplace and going, oh, that one little rock in your fire, that is a gorgeous rock. We don't. We look at its entirety and go, that's a beautiful fireplace. Well, that's the way God looks at us. He <clears throat> especially wants us to take care of ourselves as the rock, but the whole end result is his building place. Now, there are very specific pur purposes for building each other up. I'm getting, I'm going somewhere. So just try, just hang with me and let me do this. We are to build each other's faith. Colossians 2, 7 says, We are to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. In other words, we are to be built up in him, built together in him to establish ourselves in his faith or in the faith for him that's what we're supposed to do when we build or edify we are building each other up in our holy faith now ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 have several things that we're supposed to do and it says this and he gave himself he gave to some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, or the building up of the body. Okay, so God has given the fivefold ministry to build up the body, to build it up. Now, here's why we're being built up by the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the pastors, and the evangelists. That's one of me. I, I am part of that fivefold ministry. I have a calling on my life to do what I'm doing. And as such, I am, um, I am declared by the Father to be able to build you up, to build each other up, to do these things. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. Unity, that means the same faith. Not your faith and my faith and one church's faith and this church's faith, but all faith, not faiths. Faith, the unity of the faith. What is the faith? The faith is Jesus. And then we all come into unity with Jesus. You know, I have said often, I, we are in the same river, just different boats. I don't. It doesn't matter to me what boat you're in. You might be an Episcopal boat or a Baptist boat or Pentecostal boat. It doesn't matter as long as you are in the Jesus River. Get in a boat and go the right direction. Amen. You know, I've, I've shared this before. I have stopped calling myself a Christian because Christian has such a negative connotation in a lot of places. I am a believer. And I, I just say, I'm a believer. Well, what denomination? I, I'm a believer. What church you go to? 
I'll tell them the church, what denomination is that? Well, it doesn't matter to me. I'm a believer. I go to this church, or I'll go speak at this church. I'll have a conference in this church. We're believers. That's unity of the faith, not one church against another. And Paul says that we're to build each other up for that one faith. And then it says that we might have the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, when we edify one another, when we build each other up, we come to the saving knowledge of who God is and a greater knowledge of who God is, the Son of God, who Jesus is, not just a Savior and a Master or Lord, but as healer and restorer of the breach and the Redeemer, uh, as uh, the sun and the moon and the star, the, the coordinator and the creator of all those things. We get to know Jesus better when we build each other up. And I'm going to show you how we do that. And then it says, We are built up to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, we are to build each other up until we attain the fullness of Christ. Now, we may never reach that. In fact, we will not reach that on this side of eternity. But we're to build each other up to edify one another until we are full of Jesus Christ himself. Amen? So, how do we edify one another? What is this process? Well, Paul gives us a beautiful example on how to do this. And this verse has been a part of my spirit for a long time. It's one of the verses that God used to teach me how to love, how to be patient, how to not get angry, how to not let angry words come out of my mouth, how to not lash out at people. See, I was lashed out to the other day, and it just penetrated deep in my heart. It just broke my heart. It's a, it's a tender, fragile place to be broken by someone that you don't expect to be broken and hurt by. And that's what happened. But God gave me this beautiful answer to what this person did. And here it's Ephesians 4, 29. Circle it, highlight it, put a star by it in your Bible. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt, some verses, some translations say unwholesome. Let no corrupt or unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but, and unless, it is good for necessary edification or building up, and that it may impart grace to the hearers. Let nothing come out of your mouth unless it builds up and unless it imparts grace to the person that you're speaking to. Whew. If we follow that scripture alone, we would talk a whole lot less. <laughs> because a lot of times what comes out of our mouth does not um, complete those two things. Whether it blesses and builds up or whether it imparts grace to the hearer. We might be more careful how we treat people in our lives. And I'm not just talking family members. I mean, when you're in a restaurant and your server brings the wrong meal or something's wrong, when you speak to them, does that impart grace to them? Does that build them up? Or do you tear them down? Are you just just complaining them and blaming them and tearing them down? You know, we are to build, build people and be grace bearers and imparters. So the word corrupt, let me just start with this word corrupt. The word corrupt here means rotten. Can't, that's pretty basic. Let no rotten or worthless thing come out of your mouth. Now, it's you, that word is used for spoiled meat, rotted fruit, or you ready? Crumbled stones. It's the same word. If you saw a bunch of rotted meat or rotting meat, you would use the same word for unwholesome or corrupt. If you saw a pile of rotted fruit, you'd use the word corrupt or unwholesome as it is in this verse. If you saw a pile of crumbled stones, you would use the same verse, the same word that says let no corrupt or unwholesome. That's what that pile of rocks is. And so what God's showing me is that our words need to be wholesome and need to be not corrupt or genuine and good and righteous 
because that picture, if I am bringing corrupt things, I'm just like a pile of crumpled stones. That's what's in me and coming out of me are crumpled stones. But you see, the verses I read first said we are jointly fitted stones. And so if I'm just spewing forth corruptness or um, a pile of broken, crumpled stones, how can I possibly shape you if I'm just spewing rocks at you? How can I shape me if that's all that's coming out of me are crumpled rocks? We have to learn how to speak edifying, wholesome, righteous words from our mouth. This world, we're in election season where everything we've heard on TV fits this verse in the negative. That all we heard were candidates just speaking forth insults and criticisms and outright lies and defamations against their opponents. We're in a world where it's okay to use vulgar language on TV. I mean fat vulgar language on TV. We're in a, we live in a society where it's okay for parents to, to yell at referees and umpires and officials during sports games or to yell obscenities and, and profanities during the game. We have so much corruptness that comes out of us. Why would we as the body and the church want to add to that unwholesome corruptness? Why would we want to spew crumpled stones? I don't want to be a stone thrower, let alone a crumpled stone speaker. Our words can crush fragile living stones, but they can also strengthen and perfect them. Loving words edify. 1 Corinthians 8.1 says this, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You see, if I'm just spewing knowledge it just puffs me up but when i begin to speak in loving words and loving tones i edify i build up that is so important our words can bring good news and peace and happiness or joy luke 6 45 says this a good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth good And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. Now that verse starts out by saying a good man's treasure. Now that the treasure is a deposit of wealth. That's what the word treasure means. So inside of me is a deposit of wealth. Now it says that there's an evil man has an evil treasure and a good man has a good treasure. So I have a deposit of wealth inside of my heart. Now that wealth could be evil and unrighteousness and foul mouths and insults and hurtful things or I can have a deposit of wealth of good, edifying, upright, wonderful, righteous things. And out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth speak. And so this person who hurt me, in the abundance of that person's heart, there came forth the evil treasure that that person had stored up. And it came spewing out at me. Right? My response, and, 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 and this is only God, this is not Jenny Fister, this is the Holy Spirit, kept my tongue from retaliating back. And basically all I said was, well, uh, you know, that's, that's what you want, and that's how we'll deal with it, and I love you, and I'll always love you. And that's what, that was a deposit of wealth in my heart toward this person. Now, God is working all things out, and we're, there's a restoration that's even now in the works. And I honor God because He's the one doing that. But we have a choice. We can either speak forth and deposit wealth in us and speak forth out of that wealth, whether it be good or bad, and we need to choose. Our words should always encourage and comfort. Therefore, comfort one another and edify or build up one another just as you're doing. You know, this this 1 Thessalonians 5.11, and Paul is assuming that you're already doing that. He says, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. He doesn't think we should be doing anything different. As Christians, Paul is assuming that we are doing the good and right thing, but so many of us are not, are not, are not. The church needs to turn this around. We just need to turn it around. God tells us that life and death, blessing and cursing, are all lying within the power of our tongues. We know that. Each time we utter a word, we make a choice. 
Is this word going to bring life? <clears throat> is this word going to bring death? Is this word going to bring a curse? Or is this word going to bring, bring a blessing? Is this verse going to be corrupt? Or is it going to be wholesome and righteous? Is this word going to steal grace from a person or impart grace? Is my word going to steal blessing and goodness from that person? Or will it bless and place goodness on that person? We have a choice. The words we use can heal. I wrote down a list. Can heal, restore, uplift, deliver, and even save someone. What an awesome privilege that God gives you the ability to have the words of life. We have the wonderful words of life. Why would we ever want anything else to come out of us? Really, really, really. So here's where I really, I wanted to get to this. I, I, I sort of went through this whole first 20 minutes or so just to get to this point. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's that deposit of wealth that we were talking about from Luke 6.45. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Out of the abundance does the heart speak. And Colossians says we should be singing with grace in our hearts. And then uh, Ephesians 4.29 says that we might impart grace to the hearers. So if we sing with grace in our heart and we deposit the wealth of grace in our heart, then when we speak, we can impart grace to the one who hear us. That's Colossians 3.16, uh, Luke 6.45, Ephesians 4.29. Link, link, link. One based on the other. But let me just kind of go this way for a moment about hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. Because the Bible says in that verse, speak to each other in psalms. It says, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. In other words, here's how we're supposed to deal with one another. With psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And then it says, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So we're supposed to have grace in our heart so that we can do the other part. Speaking and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let me give you a 20th, 21st century spin on, on that verse. Psalms. We have benefit of history. And so Psalms are what David wrote. And he wrote them about the Father. He did not know there was a Savior yet. He did not. He knew there was a Messiah. But he didn't know that Savior was Jesus. And he was. And the Psalms are really mostly about God the Father. And then we have hymns. Well, the hymns that I know, uh, I surrender all to Jesus, victory in Jesus. I stand in the maze in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus loves me. You see, most of the hymns we sing are about Jesus. And then we have spiritual songs. Those are the songs that sort of just rise up in you that you may have never known before. They're just words that come out of you. And you kind of sing a happy tune or whistle something or sing something of words that you've never heard before. God says we're supposed to admonish and teach one another with songs, psalms, the Father, hymns, Jesus, spiritual songs, the Holy Spirit. You see, those three things are what we use to deal with one another. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not Jenny Pfister, not myself, not my own words, but the words of the Father, the words of the Son, and the words of the Holy Spirit. Only then can I have grace in my heart singing about them all day long. What more powerful force is there than imparting the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to someone's life? Oh, how powerful and amazing is that? That Paul says, when all is said and done, here's how you edify and build each other up. This is what comes out of your mouth. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. If those three things are all that you impart, that all you speak about, and that doesn't mean you can't talk about football or about the Super Bowl or about baseball or about pizza or about the how pretty your house looks or the kind of paint you want. That's not what I'm saying. But if we do that all shaded by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and we impart grace to the hearers, can you imagine where this world, where the kingdom, where the church would be if we could do that for one another to build each other up? Are your words accomplishing that? Are your words accomplishing Colossians 3.16? Are your words accomplishing 
Ephesians 4.29. Are your words accomplishing Luke 6.45? Because if they're not, this is the day to turn. This is a day that God wants to change everything in the way that we deal with one another. Oh, let God dwell in you in this way and speak forth his praise because it's he who is intermingling himself with you, painting a picture of your life so beautiful, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, In Moments Like These, Volume 2, by Jenny Pfister. Moments Like These, Volume 2, is available at Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.